A call for alternative societal structures. Hello everybody. And to all who I shall also send this to. Institutions. Uh, just a second, looking for my microphone. Okay, found it. So, um, today... In my dear diary on YouTube with a sniffly cold I decided I'm going to make a little talk which is going to be made more professionally later as a small audio book uh, with better narration and this one is going to have some interceptions I'm going to add to the story, which is actually an article I'm going to publish on my website at johnspencer.com. But I want to share this on YouTube and Facebook first, and then make a, a more, how would you say, more academic and uh, officially readable version, formatted version. So, it's because I find like Jiddu Krishna Mercy, Krishna Murti called it the humanity is suffering an extreme crisis in consciousness. <laughs> Something I've been aware of for a long time, and which I've suffered myself because I'm human. But my crisis in consciousness is uh, uh, has a spontaneous self-liberating thought process to it so I destroy the the crises that arise it sometimes takes me a long time sometimes a short time but that's what I do so this talk is a call for alternative societal structures because I have this belief that everybody has gone so deep into the assumption that there's only one way to do things on planet Earth with the human race, with our world, not the natural world, our imaginary society and worlds and our politics and the way we survive and exist and our system of rule and governance and education and employment and money and exchange and uh, different countries, different nations and stuff like that and uh, conflicts and uh, various related um, aspects so and it is I'm making a call for alt alternative societal structures by explaining that there are other ways it's not the only way this is the, the assumption is the only alternative is to go to school, pay for it, so that you can be paid working for somebody else later. Not uh, an apprenticeship world where Jack Smith, son of John the Blacksmith, inherits his dad's blacksmith smithery, uh, and he doesn't go to school because he doesn't need to, and stays with his family all the time, and he learns from his dad what he needs to know um, from his mum which is how to cook, how to chop wood and how to be a blacksmith and lots of other things and wisdom of the world like you know family is more important and don't believe others too much and advice of your dad instead of some teacher who works for the state and is not allowed like I talked to the headmaster of my son's school in Singapore and um, said I heard you all children in in Singaporean schools have to sing the Singaporean national anthem every day at the start I forbid that with my son because I don't like the state and schools forcing nationalistic thoughts into children's minds especially when my son's half English because I'm English I'm his dad and so what if in a hypothetical situation England and Singapore were at war 
and my son was conscripted into the Singaporean army and I was in the British army and we were at war and we met each other on the battlefield Singapore and England would want us to shoot each other and so I forbid that and uh, the teacher said to I really understand you I can't say too much about this on the form I say it's okay I know in Singapore you have to be careful what you say there's not a lot of freedom of speech and you don't even have to comment on that please don't because I don't want you to get in trouble and he laughed which was kind of saying yeah exactly you're right I don't agree with you on this phone because the government will persecute me then yeah. but what he did explain was says, I'm sorry I can't fulfill your request because the government forces our school and all schools to do that it's not us doing it it's the government stipulating that the school has to make all children sing the national anthem I said oh didn't know that thank you well I'm very sorry about that I'm glad you understand me not pleased about it but well can't blame you for it thanks for telling me I'm a bit sad about that but I'll see if I can take that up elsewhere which I did I never even received a reply from the other ministries or from the United Nations so crisis of consciousness yeah. and we need an alternative societal structure because how I just explained it just shows it doesn't work uh, my son was kidnapped to Singapore there's a rule called the Hague Convention to return kidnapped or abducted children parentally abducted internationally parentally abducted children this is where a dad takes your son and you wake up Mom wakes up and he's, they're both gone. He spent five years looking for them, then five years in court, and still don't get to see them really. And by that time, they're brainwashed to hate you. So, uh, there's just th tens of thousands of kids around the world every year that happens. There's a United Nations treaty to stop it, all the member states have signed it, but every time it happens, each member state covers it up and the children don't get returned so we need a new structure mm -hmm. that's two examples and I'm sure you've got your own if you agree with me you'll be thinking of your own examples that prove that society isn't working so in this really tumultuous uh, modern world we live in I believe one cannot help but feel a profound sense of unease about the direction in which humanity is headed. And from the pervasiveness of conflict and the inequality to the erosion of trust in traditional institutions and governments, it's evident that we're facing a massive crisis in consciousness. One that demands urgent attention, I believe, and a concerted action and that just doesn't mean well it actually is probably going to be up to us the people the public but I actually by concerted action I'm talking to governments and to NGOs and to corporations which are all kind of well impolitely in cahoots and uh, politically correct I would say they're all affiliated and uh, intertwined and inextricably intertwined since so long that they couldn't untangle themselves even if they wanted to yeah which is why my son's uh, abduction was ignored because the financial uh, trade deals between Singapore and Great Britain and the geopolitical uh, aspects uh, of um, Singapore being one of the West's strongest footholds in Southeast Asia they're not going to let my son's abduction uh, start causing the UN to give a sanction to Singapore <laughs> remember the, the poor fellow who was imprisoned in North Korea the American 
and was sent home and died a few days later after doing slave labor in prison. He didn't see the American government or consulate or anybody save him or get him out. That's because they also buy uh, gas. So Europe was buying gas from Russia at the time. So, um, you know, and China too, you know, Trump's there criticizing China, but 90% of the products he sells on his websites, his caps and his t-shirts are all made in China, you yeah. know, and he sort of keeps meeting with the Prime Minister of China, and he's a good friend, and he's actually, he's saying all American made, but he himself is buying Chinese stuff, so anyway, we need an alternative societal structure. So, <laughs> so, and it demands urgent attention and a concerted action from all governments, especially those who are not collaborating with each other, or dissolve all governments and have a single planet Earth and uh, what I call an autonomous. Um, self-governed state which means that not the lords of the houses of parliament vote on a law rather like when you're voting in an election every single citizen who is of enough age to understand yeah, gets to vote on every single act of law and uh, due process that gets presented and introduced into it, the constitution of the people of planet Earth. So basically, every single person of Earth gets a vote in every matter, on every law, and every amendment to every law have to be informed, just like every lawyer does. Yeah, unless you don't give a shit and don't care and don't get involved. Like me, I've never voted in my life because I don't believe it's democratic. I don't believe that democracy exists or what they call democracy is not what people think it is. It's just as despotic as a, uh, what would you say? Well, it's despotism really. It's a form of despotism, but it's group despotism. despotism. So... It's a crisis of consciousness in humanity. It's not how we're supposed to exist. And at the heart of this crisis, <clears throat> there's a fundamental disconnect between our collective aspirations as a human race yeah, for a more just and equitable society and that of the entrenched systems of governance and economics that perpetuate inequality and division. Yeah, they perpetuate it. Inequality and division, which means uh, a difference in um, there is a rich and poor, and a middle class. And some countries just have rich and poor, or very rich and very poor, and are very rich and completely destitute. Some have six, like in India, you know, the caste system. Yeah, so. Um, so, these entrenched systems of governance and economics that perpetuate the inequality and division between people, countries, and companies, and governments, and, and it's not good. And I think for too long we've operated under the assumption, the blind assumption, that democracy and capitalism are the only viable models for organizing society. Yeah, and that we've ignored the inherent laws. Uh, sorry, we've ignored the inherent flaws, laws, and the inherent laws. No, but we've ignored the inherent flaws, meaning uh, imperfections, and the limitations of the systems we're using. Yeah, democracy, if you want to call it that, rule and governance, and uh, paid education for paid employment instead of self-employment which is only available to those who have enough money to set themselves up and even that doesn't mean you're going to succeed so there's a risk in there anyway 
<clears throat> so one of the central issues that plagues our current societal structure, in my belief, is uh, the prevalence of paid employment and the economic inequalities that it perpetuates. Perpetuates meaning uh, makes it just continue and continue and continue and keep it going, and keep it alive, keep it running, that system perpetuates itself yeah, again and again and again generation for generation and uh, by tethering individuals you, me, everybody who went to school and looked for a job afterwards uh, by tethering us to wage labor meaning working in a factory and getting a wage at the end of the month yeah, and relegating humans to the status of being mere cogs in the machinery of production because that's what you can compare it to if you're working in a 7-eleven or in a factory you are a cog in the machinery of production yeah or if you're even uh, writing out the affidavits or uh, re writing an affidavit from a letter from a client as a lawyer you're also a cog in the wheel of production, right? Even if you're working in the royal palace, you're still a cog in the machinery of production. It's not your palace. You have to get up and go there, and you have to dress like they tell you, and you know, even if you're president, you have to do that, yeah? And wake up earlier than you want, yeah? And be dogged by the press and stuff, mm regardless of whether it's an asshole president or a, a complete despot. Anyway, so um, relegating humans to be merely like cogs in the machinery of production, uh, we, <laughs> we humans, uh, the system we have made, not we, the system that we humans have designed which is hard to topple and perpetuates itself now, uh, denies humanity the opportunity to pursue its passions. So it denies individuals, you, me, everybody, to pursue our passions and to fulfill our true potential. Hmm? No time, you're going to go to the factory. Moreover, the concentration of wealth and power in the hands of a privileged few exacerbates social divisions in my opinion it does think about it yeah there's some very very poor and very very rich yeah very few countries have a middle class mm -hmm. and this uh, makes social divisions where people look down on others or where some people have more rights and get away with more than others and some get away with less uh, some people have a more right to uh, legal assistance and some people get no rights at all and get abused. And it's usually the wrong way around. The wrong people getting abused and the wrong people enjoying everything. Yeah? And this undermines the very fabric of uh, democracy if you want to believe democracy is something that is fair. Yeah? Because democracy is supposed to be fair, yeah, but it isn't. <clears throat> and uh, apart from that, the commodification, <laughs> the uh, meaning making it a normal, accepted, and assumed thing that has to be. The commodification, and making it generalized, the commodification of education has led to a system, meaning making schools, making go to school instead of being apprenticed to your father's business or your mother's business or the farm or whatever. Yeah. Uh, has led to a system in which access to knowledge is contingent upon the individual's ability to pay, meaning if you can afford the education or not. If you can, you go to Harvard, go to Yale, get in the schools, whatever, yeah, you get to be a powerful rich person. 
but you have to be the son of a rich person to go there or have money to go there. If not, you go to a comprehensive government school and end up working in a factory. So, if you get to pay for a higher education, then you will have a higher social status, unless you really screw up. And if you don't, then you'll have a lower social status. Yeah. So that's why uh, it further entrenches our current system of <laughs> open quote democracy close quote uh, further entrenches social inequality, and it limits the upward mobility of uh, less wealthy people to be able to pull themselves up out of the gutter and climb up the mountain yeah, to Nob Hill. So instead of nurturing the inherent curiosity and creativity of our youth and of humans in general, because I'm very curious and I'm a creative, I'm a creator, I make music, I make videos, I make podcasts, uh, I make art, I used to be a tattoo artist, musician, and a uh, student of sacred geometry, and you know, many things, yeah. Uh, etymology, semantics, and uh, antique, occult, Buddhist amulets and items, and ancient scripts, so anyway, talking about myself here. I see you want to talk about the crisis in consciousness and a call for an alternative to the current system we are using. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this social inequality, as I said, it limits poor people from climbing up. And instead of nurturing the built in curiosity and natural creativity of our youth, yeah, the young people, of every generation. Instead we subject them to a standardized testing and uh, what I call rote memorization, like doing your times tables. You know, 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, 32. People memorize that. I don't. I was so slow at maths in school until one day the teacher asked me, he says, when you're doing your timetables out loud, you're so slow, it's really driving me nuts. I don't believe you're that stupid. He said, what are you doing? Can you explain what you're doing in your head when you're telling me the timetables? And he, I suppose he expected me to say, well, I'm remembering what I memorized. I'm trying to remember what I memorized. What I said was, well, I do it like this. I, uh, what did you say? Uh, Three times four, yeah? So I go one, two, three, four. That's four, yeah? So four. Two times four is eight. And then I go four, and then and I go five, six, seven, eight. I count four on my fingers. Then I do it again and go nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So, it's, so he said to me, you're doing your times tables by doing actual mental addition one by one in your head. I said, yes. He said, oh, in that case, you're not slow. You're incredibly fast. You're not memorizing this? I said, no. If I was memorizing it, that wouldn't help me to calculate maths. I thought you were supposed to learn how to actually make the calculation, not memorize the answer. And he smiled. Unfortunately, it was my last year in school, so, um, and I left at 13, so I'm not qualified. So, got subjected to standardized testing and rote memorization, as I was saying, uh, which I didn't do. I didn't conform. Yeah, and it stifles the, the intellectual growth of the youth and perpetuates a cycle of conformity because they conform to that memorizing the standardized tests and rote memorization. Luckily, I have ADHD. I didn't conform. So I differ slightly in that, but in general, uh, through our uh, mass education system, paid education system, with certain itineraries and topics, uh, we subject ourselves in our youth during school to standardized testing and rote memorization. And it stifles our intellectual growth in that time. 
and it perpetuates a cycle of conformity, that we conform to those beliefs and assumptions and don't ask further. Furthermore, our current political system is really ostensibly based on democratic principles. I could talk for an hour about what do, what are democratic principles, but anyway. So, because, yeah. So our current political system, ostensibly, or I'd rather say, actually, I change that to allegedly based on democratic principles. It's in reality a facade. And it just serves the interests of the elite, in my opinion, and that of many. And if you study, you will see it does. Uh, the influence of money in politics has corrupted the democratic process since before any of us were born in living memory. And probably since the Greeks invented democracy without realizing it was going to be called democracy and that they were going to be recorded as having invented it. <laughs> uh, but this influence of uh, money in politics through the elite has corrupted the democratic process. So there is no democracy. Yeah, it's corrupt. Rendering elections little more than a charade. Yeah, elections in which the outcome is predetermined by the interests of the wealthy and powerful and uh, captains of industry. So as a result, the voices of the marginalized and disenfranchised uh, members of society are of course systematically silenced <laughs> leaving them powerless to effect meaningful change yeah, almost powerless if they knew some secrets about their own powers then they wouldn't be powerless we wouldn't be so powerless but anyway it's another day on that <clears throat> so speaking in the light of these systematic failures I've spoken about with our current uh, system of <laughs> democracy, politics, geopolitics, rule and governance and economics, paid education and uh, employment, I think it's imperative that we explore alternative approaches to organizing society and make these approaches that prioritize human benefits, that humanity flourishes, and to promote collective well-being of all, all nations, all people, of all religions, of all cultures, and to um, place well-being and collective well-being uh, above profit and power. Yeah which is currently what is being placed most highly, profit and power. <clears throat> so, how do you do that? It's easy to say stop it, but you need to offer an alternative system. If not, how can you say stop this? You say, well, tell me how else to do it. Yeah. So one such approach is the concept of self-employment. So anybody who knows me really well knows that I've just done my own thing almost all my life. I'm self-employed. And self-education. I left school at 13. I did learn a lot of good stuff. Up until 12, I went to a very, very expensive public boarding school, yeah? Of elites. At 15, I was living on the streets. So, I had a varied life, but yeah. That's why I understand both ends of the spectrum. Because I've lived in both environments. <coughs> So, um, I believe that one approach is, from my own experience and achievements, is self-employment and self-education. It's all you need. Uh, and I believe this empowers, it's empowered me, and it will empower most individuals to take control of their own destinies and pursue, pursue their passions free of these stupid constraints of wage labor, working for the people, or freelancing, and standardized curriculums. Yeah. Actually, you should say curricula, not curriculums. You have one curriculum, two curricula. So, apart from that, I think we should 
try our hardest to um, instigate or cultivate to 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 um, promote a culture of solidarity, meaning oneness, on a planetary level, instead of feeling separate by culture, language, religion, and blah blah or nation, yeah, and mutual aid between people and individuals and nations, individuals, neighbors, villages, houses, towns, countries, and, uh, what do you call that, God, continents, until we have just one country, mm, the people of Earth. Additionally, so, apart from that, yeah, Mutual aid uh, for the needs of the community. Uh, we should remember that this mutual uh, collaborative attitude and way of living, as an as a new principle of a new system of society that it should take precedence over individual gain and your individual egoistic wishes to not want more than others and to be prepared to help others it's a good thing because if you did if we did we would also receive precisely the same assistance always when needed back if we gave it when we saw it needed so if everybody collaborated on a global basis it requires it like if you do it and the other person doesn't do it back it doesn't work everybody has to do it so we have to cultivate a culture of solidarity the same way they've cultivated uh, we have cultivated over the last few hundred years a culture of separateness we should now cultivate a culture of society solidarity yeah because one way or the other we're programming ourselves to accept and assume that this is how we do things but the current system is causing a crisis in consciousness and separateness war strife struggle uh, a big separation in wealth and poverty and so many things and destroying the environment yeah uh, and it'd be better for us to foster empathy and compassion and uh, work together to build resilient communities that are sustainable and support and uplift each other in preference to what we're currently doing which is to perpetuate a cycle of competition sorry competitiveness i prefer to say of competitiveness in business in beat your thy neighbor in i want to be more important more famous whatever uh, a cycle of competition and exploitation is what we are perpetuating and we should change that to have resilient collaborative communities that care for each other as individuals and community and that we all support and uplift one another yeah instead of perpetuating this stupid cycle of competition and exploitation yeah you got a PhD, I got a bachelor's degree. Oh my God. Which means you get a better job, become more important, get more power, more money. Whereas I stay with that paying a mortgage off on a house. And I don't get a beautiful wife like you. Oh my God. Anyway. Hmm? So I think we should, I think governments more than we, because I think a lot of us have already reevaluated this. But I think, um, those who can really bring the change through legislation and then through collaboration with other countries and continents uh, the politicians and governments and the bankers and the, the elite and those in power who influence all of the ones in power <laughs> the really richest mm. uh, to reevaluate our relig relationship with the natural world recognize our interconnectedness with all living beings yeah, and with nature and to stop pretending and talking and saying we're doing something about it and to actually address climate change and, uh, and biodiversity loss for example ecological crises that we're facing 
which are a direct result of our, humanity's, reckless exploitation of the planet's resources. I don't think anyone can argue that. Well, there'll be somebody somewhere who will argue it, but anyway, send him up in a corner and let him argue with himself. Only by embracing a more harmonious relationship with nature can we hope to secure a sustainable future. And that future is for generations to come. Your sons, your grandsons, your granddaughters, your daughters, their sons and daughters. Yeah, not just us. Yeah, we're leaving this world behind for our children. So what world are we, have we created? And are we going to perpetuate it so that our children and grandchildren have to endure what we have had to endure? Hmm? The crisis in consciousness that we face today is really due to the inherent contradictions and injustices of the current societal structures we have and we need to challenge the status quo and this perpetuation and we need to adopt and show that they work Ad uh, adopt alternative approaches so that they work Ad alternative approaches to what to governance economics education i won't say employment because I don't believe in employment. I believe in life, yeah? When a lion goes out looking for food, or a monkey climbs up a tree picking fruits, he's not going to work. He's not being paid. He, he's after the fruits. So are we. But to get the fruit, we can't go up the tree and get the fruit usually. Or we don't for some reason. We think we have to go work for somebody, get shouted at, not want to be there for eight hours and then we get some money so we can go and buy some fruit the monkey just climbs up the tree and takes some think about that yeah it's very simplistic but i think it shows the basic heart of the matter and you can then go into more complex scenarios and see if i'm right yeah i'll see if you agree and you can feel it and I really think that if we look at a different way to how the world could be run, uh, governance, what is governance, you know, ru some people ruling over others? Humans have never wanted that, we've just endured it. The only people who've ever wanted that are the people who govern. Hmm? And even they don't enjoy it because uh, even the prime minister or president has to do what he's told and wake up early. And he doesn't make decisions. He doesn't even understand uh, microbiology and uh, atomics. And so he just sits on his desk and all the experts come in with pieces of papers and new laws to pass and amendments. And he might sometimes read, understand and agree or disagree or refuse to sign. But usually his job is to just sign 170 papers a day and make a few statements on TV and everybody else works out the details because he doesn't understand any of that yeah he's a hotel builder or a property owner or an oil mogul he's not a doctor or an engineer or a scientist and anyway, Reagan was an actor Jeez, uh, Carter was a peanut farmer, so there you go. If it was about peanuts, then maybe he could evolve his own, with his, use his power to actually influence a certain bill, yeah? A bill of rights or a bill for parliament, yeah? But if it was about genetics, he didn't understand JS about that. What does JS mean? I'm not going to say it in this video, because I want to monetize it. It's not a video, it's a podcast. Anyway, so this crisis of consciousness that we are in today, yeah, means to me that we really need to think that, hey, there's other ways for humanity to exist. Do we really need money? We found Gobekli Tepe, they were hunter-gatherers. We didn't stay in villages and have money in those days. 
but they built these amazing monuments and we lived for thousands of years quite happily without police soldiers and governments and prisons and laws. Yeah, I'm sure the odd person got killed by a lion or another person, but they do now. It's just, we have laws about it, but it hasn't stopped people from doing what they do and it never will. So there's no need to have them really. Might as well just take revenge instead of going and paying a lawyer and hope that you win the case. Just go get your own back, like at school. Kid hits you, so you go find him and hit him back. End of story. Don't need police. And um, I think if we go back to learning the specialised trades people used to have, our parents used to have uh, instead of going to school or learning to do it. Like if my son had been with me, I wanted to homeschool him. Yeah, he'd have learned important things like ancient history, the Greeks, the Romans, Carthage, the rise of civilization, evolution, uh, bio, uh, um, biochemistry, chemistry, electronics, quantum mechanics, mathematics. I should teach him a lot more that he would learn in school. But what I would teach him mainly is what he really needs, is what I know, is how to make lots of money in various ways without having to break your back or really get very tired. Or really get very tired. Sorry, my microphone went off. <clears throat> and teach him how to... Um, administrate and use my websites and online shops and businesses so that he can take them over but as it stands he's not going to be able to because he's not learning that he's being indoctrinated with the Singaporean education system which makes him sing the national anthem so he thinks he's Singaporean and forgets his half English see so I think uh, it's not just up to me, yeah, to call for creating a more just and equitable world for all. I think it's up to each and every one of us to he to heed the call to action and to try to head it as well by coming out of the closet like me and saying it, yeah. Speak out, because if just I speak out, about ten people are going to listen to this and stop listening after five minutes. It's not going to change anything. Except one person will listen to the end. Usually this is maybe one person sometimes listens to one of these podcasts to the end, gets something out of it, and writes to me and says, thanks, I really appreciated that. And I think, oh, that's great. I didn't waste my time recording that. So we need a more equitable world. And we need to get rid of this democratic voting for only a few families and the elites and the banking system and the monetary system paid education for paid employment because we were much better off when Jack the Black Jack Smith, son of John the Blacksmith and Swordsmith learned his trade and inherited his father's shop and he didn't need to go to school so he could get a job because he had one automatically when he grew up his dad's business. <laughs> and that's what I wanted my son to have. My business. But when I'm gone, my business will just dissolve online. Somebody will forget to pay the hosting and it'll all disappear. Because my son is being kept from me. And I've had no chance to teach him how to operate it all. And how to read and write Thai so he can study amulets and teach him about amulets and Thai culture and Buddhism, which is what I write about, and Thai occultism and how to chant kata and how to operate my websites so that he can continue. Which is a shame, but his mum didn't want that, so she abducted him to Singapore and Singapore misbehaved, ignored all of my court cases and even deleted one of them. So, you know, 
I would say, I'm not sure. Uh, so, uh, if you let me think for a second, I will formulate a conclusion now to everything I've been trying to insinuate. Okay. I actually wrote one. I'm looking through my notes. Ah, I got it. Okay, so I'd like to conclude with this. In the face of adversity and uncertainty, let us remember that the power to effect change lies within each of us. By embracing empathy, solidarity and collective action, we can overcome the challenges that confront us and build a more just and equitable world for ourselves and future generations. Uh, do we dare to dream of a future where compassion reigns supreme and where every individual has the opportunity to thrive and grow and become what they want and to practice what they want, how they want. I think that if people wake up, it's very hard, but enough people wake up and feel strong and brave, then together it's unlikely, but it's possible that we might be able to transform our world and build a brighter tomorrow, or what I like to call to herald the golden dawn and bring in the golden age yeah, of enlightenment. And I think it begins with the destruction of the current system, because before you can build something new, on the spot you have to destroy the ugly thing that's in the way standing on that spot you have to tear down the tower of babel of babel babel babylon yeah before you can build the palace of the house of wisdom so that was just a little dear diary based on a blog post I'm going to make on my website at johnspencer.com about our crisis in consciousness and a call for uh, a change, but not a call to the public so much. That's incitement to rebellion. <laughs> They'd have me for that. Shut me up with that straight away. You just need that to shut me up. No, 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 this is two governments and it's a call for alternative societal structures and for them to consider it. And if they don't accept it, then tell them to consider it and try and figure out how they can um, monetize it because that's the only thing that seems to drive them. Now, America says it's achieved nuclear fission, but they're not ready to reveal it to the public yet until they figure out how to um, exploit it economically and make money out of it. <laughs> so there you go. Do you think we should change this? Can we change this? Should we change this? I think we should. In which case, how are we going to do it? Well, we need to write to governments, to ministers, and we need a long time. But this is what I advocate for. A completely different society that is cashless, but not with crypto. <laughs> not that meaning. Don't need cash. There's plenty for everybody on the planet. Shouldn't have to buy or sell things like that. We should be mo more into creative jobs. We will have robots and AI to do all of the menial tasks. We should be absorbing ourselves in the things we love to do and the things we're good at, which are one and the same thing. Yeah. So if you're a dancer, you dance and entertain me. If you're an architect, you enjoy designing my house. Yeah. yeah. And I'm a builder, so I build yours, which you designed for yourself. And whatever, you know. You've got some fish, but it keeps going off. You're too many, it's hot. But where I live, all there is is salt. So I bring you a load of salt. I'm sick of eating salt. 
and you give me a load of fresh fish and we dry them out and salt some and then he's got some he's he give him salt for a load of fish and you dry your own fish out there as well and then you've got fish for the year got some fresh fish and fish for the rest of the year and all you had to give him was a sack of salt you're really happy you feel like you all you have is loads mountains of salt you're really happy you've just got loads of really luxurious fish hard to find for a bag of salt of which you've got loads and the other guy's really happy too because he's got a lot of fish that he's going to have to throw most of it away anyway and uh, now he can keep it and eat it throughout the year because he's got this amazing salt and all they had to do was give you some fish that were going to go off anyway to get that fantastic salt so like both feel they're very happy with the exchange yeah but if I sell you a pair of shoes Nikes for six hundred dollars and you see them for five hundred and fifty down the road after you've bought them from me you already start to be pissed off so when money comes in the middle that's also a part of what causes a separation between people yeah, and greed and anger and revenge and all sorts of things so I would advocate as I said for an alternative approach to rule and governance or how uh, people how we as a collective race um, wish to move po wish to move forward right so I'll conclude with that yeah and hope that together one day humanity can join hands and transform this horrible world we've made into a beautiful one so that we can promise our children and our children's children's children a brighter tomorrow that is a golden dawn of a golden age and I think we better start now how to start well I'll think up some suggestions because I know some people find it hard to imagine so I'll do that in my next dear diary on this topic Maybe not my next upload, but my next Dear Diary podcast on this topic. John Spencer, for now, signing off.